Welcome to Reboot 2030, the Democracy Schools video channel. This is our first uh, new um, uh, dialogue or interview uh, this uh, fall season. Um, and um, I'm really, really delighted to have um, Bob, Hinkley, uh, Bob Hinkley with me today. Um, Bob is an American attorney who specializes in corporate uh, law in general and in corporate financing in particular. Uh, he's a graduate from Fordham University, Gabelli School of Business and Fordham Law School. And he's a long and distinguished career, including being a partner in two of the world's largest law firms. From 2012 to 2020, he provided critical assistance to the US Department of Justice uh, in connection uh, with investigations that recovered more than 65 billions from more than a dozen of banks for illegal behavior, which led to the financial crisis of 2008. He's the author of Time to Change, Corporations, Closing the Citizens, uh, Citizens Gap, and he's written numerous articles on this idea of amending uh, the duty of directors in corporate law throughout the world. His idea is this idea of a code for corporate citizenship. Um, the idea is that existing law provides directors, sorry, the ex existing law provides that directors must act in the best interest of corporations. But that somehow gives them some kind of protection because what's in the best interest of corporations is not necessarily in the best interest of society or of the environment indeed. Uh, so he suggests to extend the code uh, and he would add a sort of a, a phrase that would go along the lines of, but not at the expense of the environment, human rights, um, public health and safety, dignity of employees or welfare of the community in which corporations um, operate. Now, this is a very, very simple addition to sort of corporate law, but it would fundamentally change uh, how, how corporate law works. Now, I'm really pleased to have Bob with me today, um, in part because, well, partially because, of course, at the moment, the, the, the COP27 is, is on and there's a sort of a, sort of a deadlock and there's a sort of a sense that possibly um, the real key with kind of reducing um, or one of the major kind of like uh, factors that would help us to reduce uh, emissions is by essentially getting corporations to play a bigger part uh, in, in that process. And of course, that code for corporate citizenship would, 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 make, that, would make that law, would make that inevitable. Um, now, um, just very briefly, Reboot started last year, last fall, um, and we have since, um, this is now the, uh, the, the, the 15th, I believe, uh, Reboot Dialogue. Um, and we have another five uh, uh, coming up uh, uh, around the Christmas. So by the end of the year, we'll have uh, done 20 Reboot Dialogues. And I'm really grateful for all the contributors so far. The format seems to work, and uh, we are looking forward to developing and extending the format next year. So uh, so bear with me. Um, in future, for the next couple of weeks, we'll again have every Tuesday um, a reboot a dialogue or interview. Um, and um, and yeah, I look forward to, you know, to basically uh, sort of uh, go through the season with you as, as we go along. Uh, let me now invite in Bob. I believe he's already here in the in the waiting room. And um, I look forward to just inviting him in. OK, oh, there he comes. Bob, good evening. Nico, good morning. <laughs> well, thank you? You very, thank you very much for joining us from Australia. Um, Bob, um, this is a really a momentous time um, at the moment. We have COP27 um, going on or not really kind of going so well at the moment in Egypt. Um, and the world's eyes are focused uh, on, 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 that, on that event. And there is a lot of I wouldn't say, well, cynicism as well, but a lot of uh, doubt uh, as to whether uh, the COP process can, can deliver. Um, we, we have obviously been through a number of iterations of this process. There's always plenty of promises, um, but uh, when it comes to the actual delivery by governments, um, we're falling short. We're, we're just not seeing the progress that we would need to see uh, to reach our 1.5 degree uh, target. Now, you are basically putting forward a quite a radical, but at the same time, very simple proposition. And I think it is a very timely proposition uh, in, in a sense that if governments can't deliver, then well, maybe we need more support from the private sector uh, for a number of reasons. A, because of course, much of the pollution is produced by the private sector. 
but also much of the money sits with the private sector. So in terms of actual investment and so forth, the private sector also would be would be key. Now, your proposition is quite a deterministic one, a, a legal one, a legalistic one, um, but in its simplicity, it's quite beautiful. Um, so today we will be spending a lot of time talking about your code for corporate citizenship, which essentially kind of extends corporate law to to hold directors of a company accountable for uh, the actions of their corporation. Um, before we get, go there, Bob, I think because um, what is really important here is, is not just your idea, but also that Bob Hinckley himself is a, a, a rather, um, you know, a, a highly experienced and, and, and uh, may I say wise uh, corporate lawyer <laughs> who's, who spent a lot of time in the corporate environment and you both know your law, but you also know corporations by heart. So you have an understanding of, of how they tick. And so by coming up with a sort of a legal solution or a partial solution uh, to a global problem, you obviously presumably have all these different stakeholders in mind as well. So before we therefore go into the substance of what this corporate uh, this code for corporate citizenship is and what the implications are. I'd like to talk a little bit about you as a person, uh, you know, where you come from, what your education is, what you've done with your life and how you came to the point of basically proposing this. So maybe you could just give me a very short bad graphical sort of rundown of where you're coming from and then we can build from there. Sure. Um, I was a, an American corporate lawyer uh, practicing ca in the capital markets, doing securities work, helping companies raise money on Wall Street, stocks and bonds. Um, I did that, uh, among other things, I did that for close to 40 years as a corporate lawyer. Um, uh, about 25 years ago, a professor of social work at Sydney University came to me, or social policy, excuse me, uh, came to me at, uh, we had lunch together, we were friends, and he said, Bob, why is it that I can't get corporate CEOs to sign on to the concept of human rights in the workplace? He says, it's not like they're opposed to it, it's just like they don't care. And for a corporate lawyer, that was a very easy question to answer. And the answer is, Stuart, it's just not on their radar. That's right. Um, their job, uh, as provided in the corporate law, is basically to look out for the financial interests of the corporations. Some people say to make money or to maximize profits. It's not really maximize profits, but it's to make money for shareholders. Um, when it comes to things like the environment, human rights, um, the public health, uh, the well-being of the communities in which corporations operate, that's a secondary consideration, which more or less is covered uh, in the corporation by the um, legal department and the general counsel. The directors themselves and the CEO are mainly con are concerned only about making money for shareholders. And that's because the corporate law tells them that. Um, and Stuart said to me, he says, well, fine, write me a chapter for a book I'm writing on that. And as I sat down and wrote the chapter about 25 years ago, um, it came to me that I ought to have a solution. Um, uh, and, and what I came to was that the corporate law doesn't go far enough in terms of uh, calling on directors to uh, do more than just make money. And that is, it doesn't do enough to get them to protect the public interest. And that creates a real problem for democracy. Because most people don't realize this, but corporations wouldn't exist unless there was a corporate law that said um, they could exist and provided rules as to how they were operating, including the rule that directors are supposed to look out for the final financial interests of the business. I think, can I just insert something here? This is a, a really interesting point because I think that, that, that this kind of special legal point actually in some ways actually 
really fueled the industrial revolution as well, isn't it? I mean, there, there is this whole idea that before, um, I, I don't know, you probably know when that happened in the 19th century, there was no, the idea of a separate legal entity, a separate person before the law um, didn't exist a bit before then. So people always- well, it, would... it, didn't, it didn't exist uh, until about the, the year 1600. Um, and it, 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 it was, the concept of a corporation was created by, uh, by people who wanted to uh, make money sailing ships on the ocean. And they were afraid if the ship went down, they would get sued by the people whose goods they were carrying. So I think it was Queen Elizabeth actually came up with the concept of uh, the corporation where she gave them a charter and said, which said investors can put their money in um, and but they can't be held liable for the amount more than the amount of money they've been put they've put in the business. That's a concept called limited liability. And so they created this new entity, the corporation, which worked quite well um, in small doses for over 250 years. And when, uh, as as time progressed, when the United States separated from England and the in 1776, each of the states decided that they too would allow corporations to be formed within their boundaries. Um, but they kept very strict controls on corporations because they realized they could become powerful and they were afraid they would use their power to harm the public interest. So for instance, if you got a corporate charter in those days, it usually lasted for a limited period of time. It only allowed you to engage in a certain business. It didn't allow you to own other corporations. Um, and in at the end of 20 years, you'd have to come back and get it renewed. And also, if sometime in the interim, you had uh, violated the public interest in a serious way, your charter could be revoked. Well, along comes the Industrial Revolution and starts to take hold in America in uh, the mid 18th century, about the time of the Civil War. And states wanted to participate in this re Industrial Revolution. And they wanted companies to set up in their states. So what they did is they modernized or streamlined their corporate laws. They made it much easier to incorporate and they changed the rules with regard to renewal. There didn't need to be renewals anymore. Corporations had a perpetual term. Um, uh, they eliminated the obligations to the public interest. So the duty of directors became that directors, the director's sole job was to act in the best interests of the company. And that gave directors a lot of flexibility. And one state after another passed a similar law. Now, it was called a race to the bottom by most legal commentators. And, and the state of Delaware won that race. Um, it today is home to probably about 60% of the Fortune 500 companies. Um, but since that time, corporations have changed again. Basically, um, the, the new law said corporations can do anything that isn't illegal. And if they do something that violates the public interest, then we'll pass a law to keep them from doing it. And in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, the technology was still relatively primitive and companies weren't that big. Their ability to do severe harm to the public interest was not very high. But as time went by, corporations got bigger, the technology got more developed. And pretty soon we found ourselves with entities, large institutions created by a uh, government, which um, could do severe damage to the public interest. Um, they didn't start out to do severe damage to the public interest. They sort of got into businesses, they became successful, billions of dollars were invested. And then they found out that burning coal or oil to, or fossil fuels to uh, generate electricity or drive motor vehicles 
um, creates the problem we have now with climate change and global warming. They found out that tobacco kills 8 million people a year. Um, so they're doing severe damage to the public interest. And the problem is when they become well-established, it's very hard to regulate them. And in some cases, they can't be regulated at all. And this is one of the reasons why the, uh, the conference of the parties that we've now on our 27th haven't been effective. We had, we've had big agreements signed in Paris and Glasgow where everybody came to the table and agreed we ought to do something. Uh, but when the national delegations went home, they ran into the problem of enacting legislation to make uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, reduce, go down. And they couldn't make it happen. And that's not necessarily, I mean, a lot of people jump to the conclusion that that's because politicians are corrupt or, or uh, big business uh, lobbies. I mean, the truth is big businesses like this have supporters too. Um, they also have rights. So when it comes to uh, writing up legislation like this, you have to negotiate with them. And the problem is that doesn't get the that isn't getting the job done. So what you to sum this all up, what you have is corporations being formed by the state that and re, end up causing severe damage to the public interest, and government can't do anything about it. And that's a real problem for government and especially a democracy. Government is supposed to protect the public interest. If it can't protect the public interest, a lot of people would say, what good is it? Um, and, and it's basically, it, it undermines, uh, it undermines uh, uh, the reason for government. Um, and it, it, it's, it's a problem that's looking for a solution. And, and what I came to was, well, the problem is direct, when a, company, when, a, when a company or industry is found causing severe harm, when it goes to the directors, the directors have to represent the financial interests of the company under existing law. And that's, that, that's a problem now because um, they have billions of dollars invested in these generating stations or these products that are uh, spewing out greenhouse emissions uh, on, our, on, our, on our roads and highways. And how do they represent, how do they act in the best interest of their shareholders uh, if, if they stop that? They're going to have to write off these investments. Let me, let me, and, just, let me just come in here for one second. Um, my understanding is just to sort of kind of to, to really kind of try to summarize this uh, a, a, a little bit. So I guess what you're sort of saying is, is that um, at a certain point, the sort of 16th century um, corporations or companies, you know, they were much smaller in those days, um, started to become persons in their own right, almost like legal entities, persons in their own right that were separate from humans. Um, right. The, that's right. So the now sets we, them up as a separate entity. That's right. So, so up until with, then, with the right to do a lot of things that people can do. That's right. That's right. So, so up until then, what you had, you had one kind before whatever kind of law, there was one person that was a human being. Uh, now you had two persons. One was a human being, and the other person was a company. And the human being was, you know, continued to be regulated in whatever way it was by law, but companies, corporations managed to kind of carve out that kind of space for themselves where they essentially had enormous amount of freedom. That worked for a long period of time. Well, no, I, I don't I don't think there's that's 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 the distinction, Nico. Um, uh, the whole purpose of government is to strike a balance between freedom um, and security, protecting the public interest. I mean, there were laws that kept people from doing things that they might have wanted to do. And there are laws that keep corporations from doing things they might want to do. Totally. But, but, but the point, and the point is, is that, that in a democracy, you generally don't pass a law until it's needed, until it shows, proves itself to be necessary. 
Um, uh, and that preserves the greatest amount of freedom, a system that works that way. Now, the problem with that kind of system, it's not a problem, it's a feature, it's a, it's a, a good thing, I think, is that it relies heavily on the self-restraint of the governed. People generally have consciences and they don't infringe on the rights of the others. They don't pollute the environment. People certainly don't do it in great quantities. Individuals can't do it in great quantities. But a corporation puts together the efforts of tens of thousands of people, sometimes backed by billions of dollars in capital. And that's the big difference between a corporation and an individual is that it can do a lot more harm. It can do a lot I, more good, but it can I, do I a totally lot more harm. I, I totally get that. The point I was trying to make is that the, the kind of this idea of the sort of the corporation as a separate legal entity sort of came in, into being at a time when technological development and corporate science was rather small so but of Primitive, course today correct. we're looking so in these elizabethan times when you know, whatever when columbus sailed across uh, to america you know a ship was at stake you know but now today you know exxon mobile with its vast kind of resources is at stake so it's a very different scale we're looking at both in terms of investment invested capital but also in terms of potential harm that corporations can cause now what is that's correct saying? and i would say i would say nico that i wouldn't even look back as far as queen elizabeth in 1600 i'd look back as far as when they they modernized the corporation in the late 18, 19th century, about the 1870s, when this race to the bottom took place. Even then, the technology was primitive and companies were relatively small. So it didn't seem like a big step for the legislature to take out these limitations on corporate behavior um, that they basically relied on the directors to enforce to make sure they didn't harm the public interest. That's right. Okay, so 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 that exactly. So, but but we have seen a massive acceleration um, in in a number of areas. And you mentioned two. You mentioned obviously the kind of technological advances, um, and you also um, sort of mentioned the the the, 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 the growth, the kind of globalization, essentially a uh, uh, conglomeration of, of of corporate enterprises and the the vast kind of sort of centers of power that that creates. Now. I would like to sort of add a third one. That's kind of just the kind of the, the acceleration or speed itself as, as 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 a real factor. And we see this in many many areas. How um, legislation lags behind. Um, you know, I mean, say take stem cells. Take. Uh, I mean, you can. There's many 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 areas in in kind of applied research. In, in, in pharmaceuticals, but in many, many also, of course, you know, with there's um, miniaturization, nanotechnology, there's serious worries I about tech. what this might do and what kind of regulation we might need. So, right. um, so regulation lags behind. We're kind of, um, and of course, you know, there is this whole area of sort of legal highs, you know, drug consumption. You know, you, you can basically whatever, consume whatever you like until it's been made illegal in certain countries, not in Germany, but I believe in the US, there is this kind of notion of a legal high, you know, and, and so there is a kind of regulation constantly plays a catch up game. Um, and, um, and of course, it creates that. And of course, that kind of space, sort of innovative space, maintains an enormous freedom, freedom, not necessarily, but, but you know, for, for corporations um, to potentially do enormous harm if they would know that whatever they kind of innovate or whatever do, if that leads to severe harm to society or the environment, then that in itself is a, is a crime or is illegal, then they probably would direct their innovation in ways or in directions where the potential for causing harm is, is minimized. Would you I kind of agree with that? Well, I, I, I totally agree with that. And that's one of the features of, of the code for corporate citizenship that I'm suggesting. Um, essentially, um, what the code is about is enlisting the um, directors of big companies engaged in legal conduct that is highly destructive. And it says that basically directors should act in the best interest of the corporation, but not at the expense of severe harm to the environment, human rights, the public health and safety, the dignity of employees, and the welfare of the communities in which the company operates. Basically, 
it puts outer limits on corporate behavior which haven't been there before and and it in, in, and it enlists the services of directors to make sure their company doesn't go there because essentially what it says is if the company goes there it will have to stop and if it's going to have to stop directors will understand that it's going to cost the company a lot of money so what they will do in once the code is adopted is make sure we never get to that point um instead of going to a board meeting and a management coming in with a new uh project that it wants to go forward with and the board of directors blessing it on the basis of it it meets the uh it, it, the return on investment goals the directors are going to also have to ask now have you checked to see if this has any potential for causing severe harm to the environment to human rights how's it going to affect our employees and the communities in which we operate and i think that's an important safeguard that will turn the uh the turn the the corporate ship a little bit from just charging ahead and worrying about problems later to being much more cautious with the public interest okay um in in, in a recent article um you, you you know you you come up you basically sort of make it very clear that in your view um uh, corporate law as it stands, according to, to your article, uh, renders democracy ineffective. I mean, we've been talking about this, but you're bringing it really right down to a point here, aren't you? Um, but, but how exactly do the, you mean this? Because of course, by putting something into law, I mean, for some people, democracy means that they have a vote on something or that they have a say in something. What you sort of, you kind of, your notion of democracy here is more structural, isn't it? You're sort of saying, well, it is in our collective interest that we, as democracies, we should decide um, that, that we have this kind of sort of code of a corporate citizenship. And that would essentially allow us to have some influence on corporate decision making, which otherwise is so agile and so um, so hard to pin down that it may evade whatever kind of scrutiny and, and, and accountability. Um, but could you go into this notion why in your mind or in your view, um, corporate law as it stands is rendering democracy ineffective? Well, there, there's probably no better example than what's happened with the previous uh, cops, okay? And, and the inability to stop uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but I want to take it back one more step. All government has to protect the public interest from severe harm, or it's fundamentally useless. Okay, um, I mean yeah, that may be it. It it questions the integrity of the whole system. Um, so my point is, is that government democracy shouldn't be creating large institutions that someday may come back to them and tell them that uh, uh, they're not, th th yes, that agree that they're, yes, they're doing severe harm to the public interest, but they're not going to stop. I mean, they're acting with impunity at this point. Um, and so uh, it's, 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 we've created a hole in our democracy by creating these large institutions um, that can harm our environment, our people, our communities, uh, that should never happen. Um, and so what I'm doing is trying to put a cap on that and bring it back to a situation where when government creates a corporation, it doesn't have to worry that someday that thing will um, uh, be generating a problem for the people, for the governed, that, that the government can't resolve, can't handle. Um, and, and the way I'm doing that is I'm, uh, I'm pressing into service the corporate directors. Okay. And, 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 but I'm pressing into service the corporate directors, but I'm looking for the corporate directors to look in their company's best interest too. Because once con directors understand that if they cross the line into severely harmful behavior, that is going to result in a serious uh, cost to their company, and they will do everything they can to avoid it. I think the other thing it will do is it will spur investment in 
new technology to solve problems that today don't need to be solved because it's not against the law. Um, well, that's a very uh, once you pass point. the code, I, once you pass the code, investors are going to say they're going to know about it and they're going to say, um, well, how is this company uh, doing uh, with the, uh, how is it, um, is there any chance that it's going to find itself in a position in violation of the code? Now, I don't want to make too big a thing of this either, because I really think the code for the more or less only applies to huge corporations. Technically, in the law, it'll apply to every corporation, and that's not a bad thing, but small companies can't do severe damage to the public interest. They're small companies. Could you, do you have more any definition? Do you have any definition in your mind what, what severe damage constitutes? What is severe damage <laughs> uh, to you? Um, <laughs> I do. Um, I, I am reminded of the Supreme Court justice when he was asked about a definition of pornography, and he says, I know it when I see it. And I think I think the world knows when it sees severe damage. And I can think of two pro, excuse me, two pro, two two instances right now, and maybe a few potential. But the two instances are greenhouse gas emissions and tobacco. Uh, we all know what's happening with greenhouse gas emissions. Tobacco kills eight million people a year. That cannot be anything but severe damage to the public health and safety. Um, are there other potentials out there, uh, uh, violators of the code or people who may run up against the code? I think there are. I think that um, uh, we, we've discussed before uh, big pharma in America and the opioid crisis. They clearly got pretty close to the line. Um, I think... Uh, uh, industries that run third world sweatshops uh, may be getting pretty close to the line to severe damage to uh, the dignity of employees. Um, and I think high tech is something ought to, which we ought to be concerned about. We're having a really rough time regulating high tech. We don't quite understand the technology and certainly the, the people in government don't understand it. Um, and um, they're using uh, various methods to separate the population into two groups that hate each other in America. You're talking about social media here, I believe. Yes. Well, yes. Yes. Um, and the algorithms that feed, uh, uh, get people in continuous feedback loops on their side and cause them to hate the other side. Um, I, I, I'm not saying we're there yet, but I think that the potential is there for that. And I think if if the code were passed and I were a director of a social media company, I would be very concerned about uh, uh, my company heading in any further in that direction. Now, um, the, the, um, my understanding is that because it would be incorporated into in, into law, um, my understanding is that it would, it would have to be done on a country by country basis, although say within the European Union, you could have a European solution, but be outside the EU, it would have to be, I mean, for instance, in the US, would you see this as a state level thing or as a federal law? Uh, and the other thing is, um, um, if, if you're talking about severe damage, I mean, take 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 the US, um, and you, you you know, like, is the, the unit of analysis here, is this the, the, the nation state, in other words, severe damage to the country, um, that in the case of say Luxembourg means something very different, yeah, if compared to say the uh, the United States or China, which is much larger countries. Or does severe damage in your uh, in your view here mean damage globally? So if a company is registered in Luxembourg, and it doesn't only cause you know, damage to Luxembourg, but also, well, what is the unit of analysis for severe damage? I mean, for example, if you take a social media company like Facebook. They are global, and you know, so it, the, the unit of analysis will always be the global level. But you mentioned sweatshops, you know, like for whatever T-shirts in Bangladesh or India. Uh, then, of course, a unit of analysis presumably would be would be the na nation state. Um, well, this, this this is a very good question, and and people have to understand corporate law a little bit to, to understand this. Right now, if we want to regulate antisocial corporate behavior, we have to regulate it wherever it exists. So if you had a business in the United States that operated in all 50 states and was 
uh, polluting more than 10 parts per billion, which the law uh, said, or maybe there was different levels in each of the 50 states, um, you'd, have to, you'd have to go state by state, okay? And, um, and what happens then is that corporate antisocial behavior gets regulated on what I call a where and how much basis. And companies then, because of that structure, they start making decisions about where they're going to set up their next plant That's because right. they look for they they jurisdiction shop. They look for the the jurisdiction that has the most lax regulation. That's now right. the code for corporate citizenship is different because it acts at the board level, so it affects the board decision making for the entire company. So that's one advantage of putting it in the corporate law. Um, uh, um, another advantage, which I'm not sure is an advantage of but, putting but it in the corporate law. But just to clarify this, one of, have one, so if, if, if that company then is registered in Delaware, and if Delaware doesn't have that law incorporated into its kind of a corporate law, um, but say whatever, California does, um, then... Um, because uh, it's it, the, the company is registered in Delaware and it's a board level thing, they can do whatever they like in, in California and they're not affected because it's, it's a Delaware no, no, company. No, 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 it, it, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Um, if you are talking about business regulation, regulation outside the corporate law, environmental law, um, uh, employee law, um, taxation, they all operate jurisdiction by jurisdiction. And in the concept of, remember, we were talking about my friend asking, how come CEOs aren't interested? Those are problems for the general counsel's department and the lawyers. And the only thing that the board does is say, are we complying with the law? And the general counsel says, yes, more or less. And we move on to the next item um, uh, on the agenda. Um, the code operates on the board of directors it it tells them they have to focus on something that right now they're not focusing on and they're not containing um and it says you have to contain your company to the point where it is not causing severe damage you have to manage your company to the point that it isn't causing severe damage they don't have that limitation now um they're perfectly uh, able to do it as long as the law doesn't prohibit them from doing it otherwise. So, oh, so if, 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 if this was an American company um, registered in Delaware, um, if this corporate law, would this have to be that incorporated into American corporate law, U.S. corporate law at a federal level, or would this be, if it, say, if it was European law, would they then also be liable? What, what is the... Every, every jurisdiction that sets up corporations has a corporate law. That's right. And that corporate law establishes people who run the company, who manage the company, and they're the directors. They might be called something else in Luxembourg, but more or less, it's the board of directors. I understand And that. it tells the board of directors, there are no limits on the way you run this company other than that. you must act in the best interest. I understand that. Now, what we're saying is you must act in the company's best interest but you can't act in a way that is in their best interest, but severely harms the environment and these other elements of the public. I understand that. My question is, my question is, where is the law? I mean, what jurisdiction does the law, if, if this is like an American company registered in Delaware, which jurisdiction is then incorporating that, that law? Where does it, it sit? It depends, it depends state from state. And I'll give you sort of the, the, the way it works. Um, in the United States, most, almost all corporations are state chartered. So they're set up under state corporate law. Each of the 50 states has a law. Some of them are based on Delaware. Some of them are based on the Model Business Corporation Act. They're almost identical. And they are, they might not say the same thing in exact text, but they mean the same thing. The duty of directors is to act in the best interest I understand. of the company. In I, Europe, each of the 27 members of the European Union has its own corporate law. And interestingly enough, 
Recently, the European Parliament passed a resolution asking the European Commission to change the law with regard to the duty of directors to make companies more sustainable. And it's a very similar uh, concept to what I'm suggesting with the code. Now that's gotten, gotten hung up in, uh, uh, in implementation, but they're still working on it. Um, I, so, so the answer is there's 27 jurisdictions there you have to worry about. And in the U.S., you've got 50 jurisdictions. And, right. and if, if, if I was, if, 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 if the company's registered in Delaware, then it really depends on whether Delaware would incorporate that code of corporate citizenship into their corporate law. Uh, and only then would it apply to that company. If it, Delaware doesn't do it, um, but Texas does it, that Delaware research company can still do business in Texas without being affected by not the... necessarily not necessarily every that's my question the ability, every state has the ability to keep foreign corporations out if it wants to most um, almost none do but they they you know they give um comedy to each uh uh to corporations from other uh jurisdictions and they allow for what they call foreign corporations whether it's Texas and Delaware or Minnesota and Delaware to operate within their boundaries. But they have the power to keep them from doing it. If, for instance, Delaware to, were to pass the code and those other two states didn't. But I think what will happen, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm very, maybe I'm, I don't think I'm too optimistic about this, but people understand these days that corporations shouldn't be harming the public interest. When I started talking about this 25 years ago, the amount of money invested in socially responsible funds was about $6 billion. Today, they're saying that over $30 trillion is under sustainable uh, management, uh, sustainable finance management. Um, 10 years ago, nobody talked about how corporations should consider the environment, its effect on society, and its government's policy, ESG. Today, every business school in the world teaches it, and every major corporation has it as part of its organizational structure. In 2000, Business Week ran a poll, poll, and it's asked Americans generally, it said, which statement do you agree with more strongly? Corporations should focus only on making money, and if they do that, everything will be best for the American economy. Or two, corporations should also take into consideration the interests of the environment, their communities, and their employees, and sometimes sacrifice profits to benefit those constituencies. And today, the, the, the number of people that responded to the second statement as being the one that they favored is not surprising. It was 94%, but I can tell you, uh, in, I, I said it was in, in, in when, when it came out in Business Week in 2000, it was a shock to people that they wanted this. The American Business Roundtable uh, two years ago um, changed its statement on the purpose of the corporation. It had always said the purpose is to make money for shareholders. Um, now, this is a organization of America of 200 American CEOs and 182 of them signed up to changing the purpose of the corporation to say that they ought to consider the interest of other stakeholders specifically the environment and employees and the communities um, everybody has come to recognize that corporations sh should do the right thing the problem is we're just asking them to do it voluntarily um, and the code would would put outer limits on corporate behavior um, uh, that at, doesn't ask them to volunteer to not um, ha severely harm the public interest. It tells them it can't. Um, that's a that's a that's a major change, um, but it'll affect a very small number of companies that are today causing severe harm. Um, and it'll be a lesson to every other company wherever they exist. And, and yes, there's probably 300 jurisdictions around the world where the code would have to be uh, enacted. 
but the law in those 300 jurisdictions is the same. So it's a pretty simple fix. It's not something that has to be negotiated with polluters or big tobacco companies. It's just, you will not do this anymore. And, and it's, you know, you, you, you called it radical earlier and, you know, I'm not sure it is radical. It's, it's the way corporations were when they were first set up over uh, uh, 400 years ago. Um, it's, it's the way investors have come to think of corporations these days as to what they want them to do. It's the way that CEOs uh, of major companies think uh, companies ought to behave. So I'm not sure it's that radical. I think it's quite popular to tell you the truth. Oh no, I'm, I'm, it's, it's only it's only radical to the extent, it's only radical to the extent that it would be a radical change. It would have a significant impact on, on, it's, on, it's on a like major across change. the board. There's no doubt about that. And so oh, in, in, in that sense- I, I, I don't, I, I didn't mean to criticize you use the word radical, but when you <laughs> no. said it, I said, well, you know, I'm not sure it is. Yeah, so. I mean, do you know, the, the actual, the, 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 the root of the word, uh, the meaning of the word radical is root. So it goes to the root of the problem. Uh, and in, in that sense, it, in that kind of classically sort of Greek sense, it is, it, it is it, radical. It, it does, it treats the cause of the disease as opposed to the symptoms. That's right, that's and, right. And it's, it's, and, it's and, in that sense, it's radical. Um, Absolutely. Now, um, uh, one last uh, question. COP27 is on at the moment um, mm -hmm. in, in Egypt. And um, you've sent me an article in the Washington Post. And um, just before our interview, I said, I say, have a look at this. And um, it's an interesting article. Some people would think of it as a, as a, as a sort of a cop out. They would sort of say, well, OK, governments have failed to kind of reduce emissions, have failed to reach their targets. And they are kind of basically basically asking industry and the private sector to do it for them. Is that is that is that a sort of a fair? And of course, um, you know, like most people have been observing, and, and your code comes right into this debate. Of course, um, so 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 within that whole debate, in terms of what's the role of the private sector in reducing, you know, greenhouse gases, and um, what is the role of government, and what is the role of citizens, and all the rest. In this, I mean, people are facing a kind of situation where we know we are sort of heading headlong into catastrophe, a climate catastrophe, um, and, and yet we all feel impotent, unable to do something. I don't think that these politicians gathering uh, in, in Egypt at the moment, that they really are devious or that they really kind of just mean to play a game. I think they would love to come up with solutions if only they would manage. Um, so you I know. agree. I, I agree. I agree. But but that article I sent you, I sent it to you for 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 two observations. The first observation is that the that the the whole system of having an annual meeting every year um, is proving to be ineffective. Uh, the reason it's ineffective is they make all sorts of fancy agreements and pledges, but when they can come home, government can't deliver on those pledges. It's right down to what we said before. When companies are well-established, when businesses are well-established, it's hard to legislate against them, okay? It's hard to limit what they're doing, um, uh, especially when lots of money is invested and, and the corporations are willing to spend lots of money lobbying to defend it. Um, the 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 other reason I sent it to you was that it talked about uh, the United States trying to set up a a fund uh, a, by through private donors for for the private sector for big investment banks and bankers and and companies like that to fund the technology necessary um, to convert. Uh, environmentally, environmentally damaging facilities into alternative energy facilities that don't damage the environment. And they were having problems raising the amount of money necessary. Now, I was a corporate finance lawyer for a long time. I think that's probably a very naive idea. I'm sorry, but um, uh, whenever you have uh, Whenever you have a corporate finance deal to fund a new facility or something, um, you, uh, you have somebody on one side of the equation that has money and somebody on the other side that needs it. 
and a broker stands in the middle and his job is to make a deal. In my experience, there's a lot of times when the broker will tell one side or the other something that isn't exactly true to get the deal done. So how effective this is going to be in terms of reducing greenhouse emissions, I'm not sure. But the problem, the real problem is the private sector in terms of the power industry and the motor vehicle industry isn't incentivized enough to start investing its own money, to start going out and talking to investment banks and saying, hey, we have to stop emitting greenhouse gases in the next five or 10 years. We've got to develop new technology to do that. And, and why do we have to do it? It's because this new code for corporate citizenship says, you know, we can't any longer emit significant quantities of greenhouse gases. That spurs entrepreneurship, it spurs investment, it's the necessity. Uh, re, uh, what, what was somebody once said, maybe it was Benjamin Franklin, that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. But that's <laughs> what gets people investing in new projects. If, if you pass the code and the companies that are now foisting their greenhouse gases on the public and into the atmosphere could no longer do that, there would be a whole bunch of companies coming up with ideas to um, uh, make that not happen. I mean, God bless uh, Elon Musk, um, the whole electric vehicle industry that's coming. I mean, motor vehicles are, are sooner or later going to get there. What they need is a little bit of push so they go faster. Um, power stations, you know, Australia hasn't built a coal-fired power station in quite a while, um, but they still got a lot of them emitting uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and they're still digging up a lot of coal and sending it elsewhere. Um, once you put a stop to that, um, humanity will come up with other solutions, and it, th those solutions will require investment. And it will be there because of the necessity, not because some government guy has a program uh, that everybody's trying to squeeze a deal into that might not really satisfy the main goals of the program. I mean, in a way, when you sort of say that there's sort of an annual meeting, um, it doesn't work. Uh, I, I, I mean, I mean, the proof is in the, in, in the pudding. I mean, of course, it hasn't worked. We, we, we've seen it, over, you know, over the years. I, I think annual meetings are good things. I'm not, I'm, I'm not against annual meetings, but the, the reason it hasn't been effective is because government can't deliver on its pledges when they go home. The national delegation, they go home and they start talking to the industry and the activists and they try to make a deal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and they don't come close. If we had, an, if at COP28, not COP27, because I think we've missed that, but if COP28, we resolved to go home and pass the code for corporate citizenship, we don't have to negotiate that with the emitters. The world has come together and decided there ought to be limits on uh, the behavior, uh, the antisocial behavior of big corporations. This is how we're all going to change our corporate law to make that happen. It's a pretty simple fix. And I think once it happens, you know, customers too are in favor of something like this. You know, all the money that gets spent greenwashing, but not just greenwashing, actually tell, building brands, telling investors or telling consumers how green companies are, um, they're going to want it. So um, uh, I, I, I think this is a win-win, to tell you the truth. Oh, it absolutely is. There's, there's, of course, one aspect of the COP series that seems quite effective. And that's a sort of the embarrassment factor. I think there is a kind of, you know, the, 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 th the interesting thing about COP is, is, is no one dares not to go. I mean, uh, Rishi Sunak, the, the new British prime minister, dared sort of to say that he wasn't going to go. And the pressure was so huge that, of course, he had to go. I don't think that Joe Biden is so keen this year either. But, and he only goes for a short, like, four-hour stopover. He's actually literally only spending four hours there. But, you know, so, so, so people are, but they still feel they have to show face. Um, and on the whole, they end up with egg in their face. And I think that is the sort of, in a way, the, the one effective aspect is, is that it keeps the, the political machinery, if you like, 
moving because there's a sort of a sense of God. We still it's, it's a it's a sort of a yeah an embarrassment factor I think which 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 in a sense but that in itself isn't enough you know and and, and in fact it can also easily kind of begin to basically backfire and kind of actually have a really a massive negative impact. And mm -hmm. I think we're beginning to see that now. It says that people, the sort of the cynics are beginning to gain the upper hand in a big way. Um, so I think this would be a very good time, as you said, to come with one or two really sort of powerful solutions. And I do think that your corporate citizenship would be one. So it would be very, very interesting to see whether there is a way of kind of getting this onto the agenda of either next year's COP or maybe the COP, you know, uh, 29, like the year after that. Uh, because after the year after that, it'll be guess where? in australia uh <laughs> so maybe <laughs> yeah well either australia or germany so it's going to be one yeah. or the other but i think australia has got a very good chance because you've got all the uh the island states that have yes. come together with australia uh right. for cop 20 i think it's cop 29 and of course that would be the perfect launching pad for the uh, it would it would give you two years to build up to, uh, to that um, but even next year, to do it next year, it would be would be would be amazing um, if one would get it on the agenda. H how would one get it onto the agenda? Have you got any ideas on that? Well, well, I don't, but I'm sure somebody out there does, and I'd be willing to, uh, uh, and I'd be very much uh, interested in sitting down with them and uh, and developing a plan for that. I, I think um, what it does need is political sponsorship, isn't it? So you'd need to have ideally a head of state or at least a foreign minister um to to basically champion it to sort of say well this is a great idea um and let's have a look at this um i think we would you know uh, and, and that would have to be the kind of the goal to kind of to find a political champion uh to to align with that with that uh, with that code maybe uh, the, maybe I, I i i'm not sure I, I i do remember another part of that article that i shared with you today where i think it was uh uh secretary Kerry said that these problems don't get solved by 30,000 people in conference halls. They get solved by f a few people around a table. Oh, yeah. Um, and but, but that doesn't mean the conference is wrong. The conference is still a good place to bring it onto the stage, to get national delegations to sign up for it, um, uh, to sign up on something that their government can deliver on. Um, so um, uh, it doesn't. I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that there, somebody couldn't make improve on the code for corporate citizenship. And if the, if there's somebody out there who, who has an idea to improve it, I, again, I'd be very willing to. Sit well, down it's, and it's scalable, it. isn't it? It's scalable. I mean, you could start with basically focusing on the environment, and then you could like over a period of years, so, and you know, like once you see how it actually operates in practice, how it beds down in in law, you could add to it. You could ex you could expand it. it, it you could you, include you, other you're areas. You're exactly right, Nico. Um, uh, when I started out, my code for corporate citizenship had eight words, but not at the expense of the environment. Um, and uh, you could start with when, when not at the expense of severe damage to the environment. Um, I, I, I don't want people to think that this is a, a panacea for all antisocial corporate behavior. It's really just for the most severely damaging. Um, you, you know what it should really say? Not at my expense. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, not at the world's expense, you know, it's uh, and that's uh, um, but I think I think actually it will have. For lack of a better waterfall effect on uh, on corporate behavior generally, all of a sudden directors will have something more to do than just decide whether or not a project meets a re re return on investment uh, criteria. Um, they'll they'll be there to actually make sure the company isn't doing severe damage to the public interest and probably improving its social behavior every year. Um, and that's a whole different mindset from where we are today. And I think it's uh, I think it'll be a very beneficial mindset. I think this is absolutely correct. I think the code itself is sort of a line to be crossed. And once you have crossed that line, you can very carefully and very cautiously over 
time expanded and and you know you know legislation needs to move you know this better than i do needs to move slowly um because it is meant to be there for a long time so you don't want to be you don't want to rush it but i mean like to start with a, a very you know it's, it's the simple proposition not at the expense of the environment and to build out from there because i can already see all the different stakeholders you know it gets very complex uh, once you kind of go beyond the environment then then instantly you're going to have all kinds of unsuspecting lobbies kind of coming out of the woodworks and, and you know you, you, you find more opposition i agree yeah. i mean you 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 um i i've always been one for saying the public health and safety should stop tobacco um but you know if eight million people are dying every year there's a heck of a lot of smokers out there now i'm not saying you should stop smoking or that they should stop smoking but i'm saying that government shouldn't be sponsoring large institutions that are mass manufacturing and distributing tobacco, That's right. uh, a product that is addictive and is killing all these people every year. Um, uh, so, but I guarantee, if we want to, if, if if we said not at the expense of the environment or the public health and safety, uh, and specifically enumerated tobacco as a problem, the the, the, ant, the anti smoking lobby would uh, be up in arms. Which is still significant, absolutely, and it also is a certain strata in society by now that still smokes. So, so you, you again, you would have, you would have the Trump supporters up in arms. You know, uh, you know, you would have a, a massive. <laughs> I mean, you know, you'd get them from two sides. You know, uh, that would be that would be a big. But no, so this has been well, really, it's like, really it's interesting. Like, it's, it's like the environment, right? The, uh, when when you talk about the environment to the Trump supporters, they tell you you're not going to be able to eat your hamburgers. You know, <laughs> but with the environment, I think it's kind of possibly abstract enough for them. With the smoking, but because it's there's an element of personal choice involved, um, it, it, it's 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 a harder sell in that way. But it, I totally agree. It's 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 entirely legit thing to add to it. it but it, I personally it's think the manufacture and it's the manufacture and distribution that's the problem. It's not it's not one person smoking uh, smoking. Um, uh, and and it creates a serious health uh, uh, problem for the public health and safety, as does uh, the opioid problem in America uh, that got so out of control. I mean, I don't think that would have gotten out of control if there if if we'd had a code that said, but not at the expense of the public, uh, and not not at the cost of serious damage to the public health and safety. I, I totally agree. I totally. Bob, now let's just look ahead. I'm very conscious of time. Let let's let's look ahead. Um, um, what I, the idea of reboot really is to have ongoing conversations with people like yourself so that we can see how over the next couple of years, these ideas sort of come into being, you know, because it is exactly the kind of like, you know, the kind of project that needs to happen, the kind of change that needs to happen, you know, for the planet to have any chance, uh, or, you know, of, of a sort of a humane and kind of like a, a future. So um, what I would like to do is invite you back in six to 12 months time to continue this conversation and to sort of see <clears throat> what has happened in, in the interim and to, to see what perspectives opening up and where we might take that and how this might uh, go forward. I think the idea of trying to get it onto a COP kind of platform um, is a great idea. Uh, and I think it's worth kind of, you know, like even kind of like once we switch off the camera, I think it's really worth thinking that putting heads together and sort of, you know, pooling a couple of networks <clears throat> to see uh, whether, uh, you know, whether there is a, a, a real possibility to get to get it on the agenda, you know, by next year or the year after. And I, as I said, I think we do need political sponsorship for, for that to really to happen. Uh, otherwise, it'll be in the kind of NGO camp and it'll be a sort of a, a separate event, really. Uh, I, 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 uh, I, I totally agree. And I would be very uh, uh, willing to come back in six to 12 months and to continue to participate with you in this. Um, I would tell anybody who's watching if they want to see what uh, what we've uh, said about uh, COP27 and how it should be on the agenda there to look at the website, codeforcorporatecitizenship.com um, and get in touch with me. I'm, uh, I'm very interested in, in, in making friends and allies to get this idea forward. Excellent, excellent. And what I will also do for, for those of you who haven't 
caught it or haven't been able to take it down, they can go to um, uh, to our uh, uh, YouTube channel, which is uh, youtube.com forward slash at reboot2030, um, or they can go to democracyschool.com forward slash perspectives, and there they will find all the um, all, all the reboot interviews and dialogues, including uh, this one. And below this particular video, I will also add the link to your website, of course. And if there's any other links that you'd like to send me, any other information that you'd like to send me that you would like me to add to it, things that people might find useful, send that to me after, uh, like after after we finish today, and I can add that to to the video as well, so people have sort of a little list of uh, you know links that they can that they can explore. That that that's great, Nico. I, that that's 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 really great. Thanks, Bob. Thank you very much for making the time. Um, it's now kind of almost bedtime in Australia, isn't it? It's kind of after nine o'clock, um, and here the sun is coming out. It's eleven in the morning in Berlin, uh, such as uh, you know globalization. Bob, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, a real pleasure to meet you and to talk to you about your code for corporate citizenship. I'm glad you exist. And you have my full support, and I look forward to continuing that conversation soon. Thank you very much. And I'm not going to bed because we have the eclipse tonight, which starts in about half an hour. So you guys will have that too when nighttime comes. <laughs> Bob, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Nico. Talk to you. Bye bye. -bye.